Hot mic. What's up? Hello. Hello. There you go. That's a little better. That's a little better. Ooh, I gotta be careful. What am I near? Um, so yes, my name is Sean Larkin. Um, this is my first time to Croatia. Uh, I'm convinced that if Americans knew, like, if they had a direct flight here, it would turn into Cancun. So I'm really grateful it's not. So this is a gem, and I'm so glad to be here today. Uh, so this this conference isn't just a JavaScript conference. Um, who here, raise a hands, is JavaScript your primary language, right? You know, you write it every day. You love it. Well, you may not love it, but you write it every day. <laughs> um, who here knows what Webpack is? Okay. Who understands how it works? Look around. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about Webpack 4 and what it means for us to start building a platform for the future. So uh, like, like I said, my name is Sean Larkin. I'm a program manager for Microsoft. Um, I help work on Microsoft Edge, Edge DevTools, but I'm also working as a maintainer of the Webpack open source project. Um, I spent a little bit of time also on the Angular CLI, and now I'm working with the Node.js Foundation on the modules group, as well as the W3C helping with the, the WebAssembly community group. So a little bit about myself, I'm a former tech support rep gone rogue. I got tired of not being able to solve people's problems. It was taking phone calls and then answering and saying, no, you have to work around it this way. And it's like, I could solve these problems. And so I started learning how to program. I learned AppleScript. Who knows, like, AppleScript? <laughs> AppleScript was my first programming language. And then I learned Objective-C, Ruby, and then I found my love in JavaScript itself. And so if you want to find me anywhere, you know, you can go at the Lark in. I think all those things, and you can find me. <clears throat> so building a platform, Webpack 4. Who's upgraded to Webpack 4? Who, who, using it? That's, I see one hand. That's really good. Um, and we tried to call this like the state of the art, right? You know, it's the most recent stage of our development life cycle. We, you know, as a promise to our community, we said, we're not going to ship a breaking change until six months. So those are, that's our release cycle. Um, and, and these are the things to kind of look forward to. Technically, it's been out for three months. <clears throat> but but why, did, why are we doing it? And how is it going to help create a platform for the future? So before I get started, I wanted to talk about, this is the first build that we actually gave it a name. And we called it Legato. Who is in music? I was a music grad in, in college. So you know what Legato means. It means to play a series of notes in a connected fashion without gaps. And uh, who here knows what Trivago is? Based in Dusseldorf. Um, they are our number one sponsor, and we wanted to give them the opportunity to be able to name our major builds. And so we reached out to them and they said, well, at Trivago, we, we usually give our projects a name with a musical theme. For example, our old JavaScript framework is called Harmony. Our new framework is called Melody. And on the PHP side, we use Symphony with a layer on top called Orchestra. It's kind of cool. Legato to us means to play each note in sequence without gaps. And Webpack bundles our entire front end application together without gaps, including the JavaScript, the CSS, any assets that are dependencies for our project. And we thought it was a good fit for Webpack. And so that was the Patrick Gotthardt, the lead at Trivago Engineering, who helped us uh, give that name. And we thought it was awesome, but it doesn't go just there. Our ecosystem is really important to us. And so if you even work for a company, you know, I want to give them and the rest of the people that are on here who help support us. We wouldn't be here today. There would be no Webpack 4 if it wasn't for all of these sponsors and backers. So, you know, why don't you give them a round of applause? This is who helps us become sustainable. Not only that, but you might say, Sean, where does this money go to? 
$32,000 last month was given back to our top contributors to our project. We not only believe that we should be able to sustain open source for those who have passion for it, but it should be something that they can make a living off of. Why should we hinder those who believe that they can provide a huge impact on, on the ecosystem? So $32,000 to date, just last month that we provided, or February. Wow, time flies. So Webpack 4, what is it about? We broke it up into three things. You know, the first is smaller and faster builds. And for those who don't understand what Webpack is, in its simplest form, it takes and allows you to write JavaScript modules, which don't work in the browser, and lets them run. It gives you performance features out of the box. If you're not into JavaScript, maybe this isn't too interesting to you. Maybe it is. The second thing was modernization. You know, how could we adopt latest and greatest technological practices in the open source, uh, you know, of the project itself, and apply it for good? And then finally, developer experience. Something we think is so, so, so important to our project. Um, and so if you broke it up, you know, you say, well, I, I need smaller builds, but we also need faster builds. And you look at this graph here, and you're like, well, to have smaller, we need to do less work. Or, I mean, we need to have a deeper scope analysis. And we need to do more work. We need to process the module graph. But then if you want faster, anything faster in programming, you have to do two things. You need to do less work, or you have to reuse the work that you've already done. And so this was a huge challenge for us. So one of the first things that we set out to do is we completely rewrote what we call the chunk graph. Basically, how we create bundles and files and the relationships between them. We use techniques from other upstream open source projects we depend on, like Uglify.js, and added them out of the box. <laughs> and then we also gained the ability to drop node 4. And so that means we can use things like maps and sets and replace objects and arrays, which in the way that we are using them are really for maps and sets and hash maps. And then I think probably one of the most important things that we've done is completely rewrite our plugin system. And I'll leave you with this one message. Hooks are monomorphic. And I'll touch on this even more. If you look here, this is an example of our plugin system source code. It's called Tappable. And essentially what you do, it's like event emitter. You mix this class into other existing classes in the Webpack source code. And it allows us to emit events. We would call apply plugins async. We'd call a random arbitrary string. And then other plugins in Webpack are listening for this event string. But when you get really nitty gritty into JavaScript performance and JavaScript VMs, the way that this is done is that we're taking these arguments and popping them out, which makes it variadic and what we call polymorphic. So there is no way for JavaScript engines to understand um, or inline the results of these functions. And so we tried to work around this. We said, well, maybe we could instead have individual methods that had fixed parameters. So this way, we could have monomorphic code. But we started to realize this is fragile. It's brittle. We would have new contributors come into our project and say, like, what is Apply Plugins 6? I have no idea what it is. And so it wouldn't work. It doesn't scale. We have over 10,000 different combinations of argument lengths and arg argument properties. And so we use this technique called lazy compiling. It's kind of hard to see in the screen, but we basically are concatenating a entire function of JavaScript together based on deterministic values for, for that hook. And so at the end, we just evaluate it, right? We just call it eval or new function. So this ensures that there is one unique or specific function for the amount of things that are plugging into it. And uh, if you know Yacheslav Egorov, 
he published a, a, you know, a post that basically said, you don't need Rust in WebAssembly to speed up your JavaScript. You, <laughs> and of course, I read this and I said, hmm, this looks familiar. You don't need uh, Rust. And you know, if you wonder why, you look at the example here and it actually shows they're concatenating or creating a template, uh, you know, a function out of a template and then evaling it. So it's the same technique here. Um, but if you know Benedict Moyer, he's one of the uh, engineering managers of V8, or I call V8 Senpai. Um, and he says, don't do this at home. Uh, don't do this in your top level code. Uh, this is a huge micro optimization. But it does result in huge performance gains. And you might be like, well, why are you showing us if you're telling us not to use it? That number. When we applied these changes and rewrote our plugin system to use this technology, 98% faster. And I thought, this is, this is a hoax. This can't be. No way. But then I checked. Like, I looked for data. I wanted data to share with people, because I can't just say, oh, it's 98% faster. Go try it. We had builds in the ecosystem that were taking six to nine hours long. And these are at scale, mind you. These aren't just your average project. These are enterprise applications that depend on being able to create and compile 30, 40, 50,000 JavaScript modules into individual bundles. And we're able to bring it down to 17 minutes. <laughs> With this one neat trick. <laughs> But yes, yes, um, uh, but I, I still wasn't convinced, right? Uh, I really wanted to provide something that we could really share with the people. Uh, at the same time, this was in our beta phase, or alpha, um, and we wanted to get people to try and adopt and hear the stories of what their upgrade you know, experience was like. And so what better way than to bribe people to let them on our Medium publication if they just upgrade? So uh, we went ahead and I, I shot out a post and I said, hey, just give me your before and afters. We really need to make sure that it is the numbers that we thought they were. And they were, 75%, 80, 85%. And this is JavaScript optimizations we're talking about, under the hood. Users not even having to do anything. Um, and so, you know, that, that was really the, that was one of our main pillars. Uh, you know, our, our plugin system is the backbone. Webpack itself is built entirely out of plugins. And so we dog food this to make sure that not only the compiler is fast, but the integrations that people write are fast. And so what about smaller builds? We talked about fast. We added features that may sound unfamiliar to those working in the Java, you know, if you're not working in JavaScript, this may be weird, but JSON tree shaking. Um, you could take this example that we have here and what it's doing is we're importing a JSON file just like an ECMAScript module. If you look at the JSON spec, you see that it's just a stricter subset of JavaScript. And so why can't we treat it like a module? So we did. Each one of the properties are individual exports. And if you don't use them, why are they showing up in your JavaScript bundles? Why are they being compiled into your code? They shouldn't be. And so you can see in this example here, I think it, when I was showcasing this for JSConf Iceland, I live coded it. I said, look, you don't even have this in your code. This for many people will drop 20 to 40% off the size of the code that they're creating for the browser. And then even more specific, um, who here writes with ES modules or loves them and understands how they work? Well, ES modules themselves are a unique specification that's been taking 20 years in the making to finalize. And it just did only a few years ago. Um, it allows you to use discrete syntaxes like import and export to allow other files to gain access or scope isolated scope and to use these variables or functions or primitives and however there are some caveats for example if you take this here in webpack 3 we had to include all of the code that was re-exported into you know your application 
Uh, the reason why is that we have no idea whether or not A, B, or C has been modified before it's reached the top level of your export. And so you can even see in our, in our development mode code here, like we had to include it. And so we created this feature we called side effects. For those out there who are huge on functional programming, it's not exactly the same. Um, but basically what this says is that if you're creating a JavaScript library like Lodash ES or D3 or 3JS, um, you name it, utility libraries are especially valuable for this. If they do not create side effects against each other when they're exporting, you can use this package.json flag and Webpack will prune out every single unused part of the code. And so uh, John David Dalton, the, the author of Lodash, coworker of mine, uh, I bribed him, I said, can I please get this into Lodash before we release Webpack 4? He said, okay, sure. And so we did some profiling and we found that in Webpack 3, we were shipping 223 kilobytes, even if you only used one function in Lodash. But with Webpack 4 and this side effects false feature, that dropped it down to what? 3.1 kilobytes. And we're, not, we're not talking about gzipping. This is just Webpack pruning the code out that's unused. So this is a huge, huge, huge advancement for those who are leveraging modules. And, you know, so all you have to do now, if you want smaller JavaScript bundles, is you just need to tree shake and mangle your exports and scope voice and minimize and package authors have to set side effects, right? No, that's ridiculous. Why would you ever have to do that? You should just have to run Webpack. And that gets into developer experience. If you had the opportunity to try it for the first time, maybe you will today, um, you don't need a configuration anymore because we are now defaulting all of these things out of the box. You can see it here in this example, there's no config. This is one of the most contentious parts about Webpack is that the configuration is part of the code that you write and it is a module and it's JavaScript, so it's subject to any of the same complexities or things that you've experienced with JavaScript. But we removed it, we said, why? With a little bit of convention, we can lower the barrier to entry. We can create better defaults. And we can start kind of a new trend <laughs> with a hashtag we call zero CJS, or zero config JavaScript. Um, and, but there's a, a distinction that I wanna make. And that is zero config doesn't just mean letting you shove everything into a single package and expecting it to work and never having to care. No, that doesn't make sense, it's fragile, it's brittle. There are other tools out there right now that can't publish minor changes without breaking other parts of their important ecosystem because it's all under one package. And so we with Webpack are deeply rooted in this concept of extensibility. It is one of our core values. And so therefore to us it means Zero config is the ability for your ecosystem to define what zero CJS means. We're now a platform for zero config. And you're gonna build on top of it and distribute it to others to create that experience that's so unique and enjoyable. And so we, we did this by adding a couple features. One is called mode. Webpack's mode is a simple property that's either production or development. We said, well, we could make a really hard choice. And we said, well, not everybody even just has two, two modes. They might have five, or they may have never have used uh, anything different between the two environments. But we said, well, if we can just force this one convention, we can do an incredible amount of things out of the box. And that's what it means to have a foundation, right? It's setting those kind of defaults. It's creating the the things that developers expect are creating a persona around what is the common denominator between anybody who's writing JavaScript code today. And so, you know, we said mode development. This is, this makes sense. It should be easier to debug. It should be faster to compile incrementally and standalone. 
It should have great error messages, and the code that's generated should be somewhat easy to read. And then we said for our other persona or environment, production. This code should be as small as humanly possible. It should be fast, incredibly fast at runtime. We should rip out any sort of development-only code using macros and compile time feature tricks. We shouldn't expose source paths. And the output should be really easy to use and leverage. And so much so that we even got rid of entire features of Webpack that were extremely, or that were heavily used, like the Commons Chunk plugin. We found that more people were trying to obsess over this, this plugin that was so hard to use um, that they would end up losing sight of what was really important, which is leveraging features like code splitting and shipping the smallest amount of JavaScript possible. But we consider this a feature, right? It's gone. We're doing it by default now. And then probably one of my favorite features, which is uh, Sam Sacconi, who works at Google, they call him technically the harbor master because he works on all of Google's build system tools and deployments. Um, but him and I paired up together and we created a, a special plugin that allows us to um, instantly profile and get unique user timings based on how long each of the individual plugins inside of Webpack are taking to run. And you can take this and actually drop it into the Chrome DevTools Timeline Viewer. And so now we can see as maintainers or plugin authors can see exactly what is taking the longest amount of time. More diagnostics, better reporting, and easier to understand infrastructure. And then finally, we, we added a, a new type of architecture for us to be able to support WebAssembly. We call this the module type architecture. Um, a lot of the code with Webpack was surrounded around this idea of JavaScript. But if you look today, you don't have a JavaScript entry all the time. You have an HTML file as your entry point. That is what's driving, you know, kind of the initial experience for you. And so this architecture that we've implemented is going to allow us to create those kind of things. Have HTML as a first class citizen. Treat it like a module type. Help drive standards in the web ecosystem to say, this is how developers do things. Why aren't we creating APIs for our platforms like this? And then one of my most, <laughs> one of my favorite ones. Uh, so what, what language is this? It's not TypeScript. This is called Walt. So, uh, Walt is a programming language built on top of WebAssembly and Emscripten. And if you can tell here, the goal is that you get to write code that feels and acts almost identical to TypeScript, but it compiles down to WebAssembly, and it creates a WebAssembly module. And then when you pair that with the capabilities of what we've been doing with our WebAssembly grant and our feature work, you can be able to instantly just import that into your JavaScript and use it just like a JavaScript module. Webpack will handle everything behind the scenes. You shouldn't have to worry about it. And then finally, like I mentioned before, dropping Node 4. We fall very much in line with Node.js and their LTS. Um, we think it's super important to have strict but immediate uh, deadlines for when we drop support for a specific version. And it helps us kind of prioritize and organize different features that we're going to support. Um, so this allowed us to convert almost the rest of our remaining code into ES6. It allowed us to remove slow code patterns, use maps, use sets. We even identified a for loop <laughs> that was t uh, being executed 8.9 billion times on one of our clients uh, or one, one of our users' Webpack builds. It's a huge build, but it was executing 8.9 billion times. Uh, we found out it was a, bu a bug in V8, and they patched it eight hours later for us. So it's this kind of feedback loop that we have not only with Node, but with the V8 team, the JavaScript VMs, um, but also our users as well. And now we can ship WebAssembly in our code base for those who are using V8, right? Node V8. 
And that's just scratching the surface. Like, there are hundreds of more features and changes that I could talk about. Um, but when you summarize it, like, these are the three things that we think are the new foundation or the new platform for going forward. How can we allow people to prioritize? Like, when you are a platform, you're a development platform, you're rooted into every front end experience. And so because of that, we prioritize our work with Preact, with the React team, with the Vue team, with the Angular team, to ensure that things like Webpack 4 upgrade are instantly handled for them, and that it's seamless. So that way, we're reaching the largest amount of developers possible that we can. And I mean, if you're using Angular today, it is now going to be shipping with stable Webpack 4 support. And just the, the size differences and the build speed wins are astronomical. Um, so I look forward to hearing from more people who have done the upgrade to, to report this information. Oh. There we go. And it's not enough, though, to just work with frameworks. One of the best parts about working at Microsoft is that Webpack is the number three most used JavaScript library across the entire company. And that means there are over 90, 100 million dollar products and web applications that rely on our, our infrastructure and our tools to build all of their web assets and properties. And so one of the first teams that I reached out to when I started at Microsoft seven months ago was Ken Shaw. He works for the Outlook Web App team. Outlook Web App, I mean, who uses Microsoft Outlook? Who has used their web experience? That is, to my knowledge, one of the largest single-page applications you know, to date that I've seen, scale-wise. And so we focused on being able to get them instantly upgraded to v4, even when it was in beta. Um, and so they're a 150-person dev team. And having optimi optimizations that are as small as going from 100 seconds to 24 seconds can mean millions and millions of dollars in saved developer time. And so we were able to get them, uh, as you can see here on these slides, we got it shipped, and they even dropped the sizes of their JavaScript code as well, allowing them to have a faster running application. And so when you say, when it's, what, what does it mean to be a platform? Somebody said this the other day, and I, I, I kind of laughed. I said, <laughs> we want to be the kernel of front end development, right? Build on top of us to create undeniable experiences. Leverage the features that we provide out of the box and the performance capabilities so that now you have a much more rich experience. The best part is that Webpack does not serve any large company. We're a grassroots project that was made for its users, created by its users. And to this day, we serve them first. And so when you build on top of ecosystem tooling and infrastructure, you really succeed uh, heavily. And so what goes beyond Webpack 4? You know, we're going to add all of these different module type APIs, URL, file, being able to give them first class citizenship. And this is going to allow us to drop a lot of old and bad practices that we haven't, you know, wanted to keep around. And the things that we're working on right now, uh, I think a PR just went up yesterday, or I guess today, technically, um, that is going to tree shake WASM. WebAssembly modules, we parse and evaluate them ourselves, and we provide the same treatment that we do for ECMAScript modules, right? The syntax are so similar that we've been able to do things like tree shake it. <laughs> and so now, we're giving WebAssembly modules that are created from these other languages the exact same optimized treatment that we would expect for JavaScript. And it goes beyond that. It's scope hoisting. It's dead code elimination. And then finally, one of the things that I've, I've been trying to work on, and I've been experimenting a lot with this, is what if we could have a preset system that we see a certain type of file or a package in your package.json, we notice, hey, this is a preset. It's just a subset of configuration that you can reuse and distribute. 
This is what it would look like to extend your zero CJS experience. And so much more than that, we want to be able to solve things that really are a great opportunity. You might say, well, Sean, why don't you guys just add multi-threading? It's like, well, guess what? We're going to be starting to work on that. Um, and even fully persistent caching. These are features we don't even have yet. And we've been able to increase just in a major version, 98% for our build speed. So the ceiling is super high, and we're really excited to work on these things. But at the end of the day, <laughs> if you're going to be a platform that people build on and develop for, you have to ensure that the people that you are serving are the developers themselves. And so whether or not you care about the future of Webpack or you don't, you, as just having a GitHub account, can go to webpack.js.org forward slash vote. This is what drives our entire roadmap and milestone. And this doesn't, it, we don't plan to ever change this system, right? So if you, if you contribute to our project, you even get stronger influence. If you're a backer or a sponsor, you get stronger influence within, within a, a fair amount. Even just as an everyday GitHub user, we'll give you one influence. And you can say, well, I don't, I don't want you to work on this. I want you to prioritize this. We put the users in control. And that's why I say it's building a platform, especially for the future. I tried to find really good definitions. And this one is kind of OK. A platform is a group of technologies that are used as a base upon which other applications or frameworks, processes, or technologies are developed. But there is a business version that I thought was really interesting. And I'll read the whole thing, but I'll show you the part that really interests me. A platform is a business model that creates value by facilitating exchanges between two or more independent groups, Blah. usually consumers or, and producers. In order to make these exchanges happen, platforms harness and create large, scalable networks of users and resources that can be accessed on demand. And I thought about this. I said, well, how? We need to be ensuring that we can do this. <laughs> And, uh, and that's the point. Being able to be modular and reusable at scale allows us to do incredible things. Who's used Vue.js yet? Vue? Raise your hand. Vue's really hot in Europe. You want to know why? Because all of China adopted it first, and it spread instantly to the European regions. That's where all the conferences are happening. Evan Yu, the author of Vue, decided to do this. They're also a grassroots project. Serves nobody but their users and their ecosystem. They said, well, OK. Why don't we take what users use every day and developers use and love to integrate with, and why don't we build on top of that? And this single file component system is powered by a single Webpack loader. Out of the box, you can, you can use code splitting with one line change. This is what building on a platform looks like. And we see it happening for many more frameworks and toolings of the future. And I mean, you know, give it like a week and you get a new JavaScript framework. Am I right? But seriously, we actually call this a renaissance. We are living in a JavaScript renaissance. What other programming language today lets you write syntax that doesn't exist yet? Java doesn't count. Because it's a VM, it doesn't count. But literally, you get to use syntax that doesn't exist right now. This ecosystem is explosive, and to me, it's beautiful. But we ask that you embrace it, because this is how we're going to end up creating and pivoting around exactly what you're trying to do today. So give Webpack a try. Build on top of it. Create new experiences. Explore what it could be like might mean building your own framework. It might just be building your own conventions or sharing something that's reusable. But give it a try. And thank you. <laughs>